Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, to this week's webinar, Wednesday, with the MSC program. Um, uh, fun presentation for you today. I am excited to introduce Professor Nashir Contractor. Uh, he's the Jane S. and William J. White Professor of Behavioral Sciences in the School of Communication, um, also the McCormick School of Engineering and the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. Um, and he is also the director of the Sonic Lab, the Science of Networks and Communities. Um, here as well, so multiple appointments just at the university. Um, very long list of, of appointments, accolades, awards um, for Professor Contractor. I will let you Google him to read all of those. Uh, PhD in communication from Annenberg School of Communication at USC. And just because I think that this must be very special for you, he's received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Madras. Uh, where you got your bachelor, and that's just got to be special, I think, to get recognition from a place that you attended. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that as well. Um, all of the awards, recognition, appointments are uh, uh, tremendous for professor uh, contractor, but I think um, from my own personal experience, what's really special is that Nash returns your emails and he returns your phone calls, and that isn't the case everywhere, um, every day, and, and he's a dependable um, person and he's just excited to help connect individuals and institutions and he's I don't know the, the living embodiment of the phrase practice what you preach and I'm excited for our time together today. Um, Nash, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you and it's so great to see many of you even if it's photographs some cases it's videos. Uh, it brings back lots of memories it's like a time compression um, since I'm seeing people here people who I knew two three four eight, 10 years ago, more than that, some cases, all in the call. So, and especially at this moment when we're all hopefully uh, in the third quarter or the final quarter of this pandemic. Um, some of you who took my class might remember that I opened the first day of class and closed the last day of class uh, by telling you that um, um, it, from my point of view, uh, networks, uh, like a virus in the sense that when I was first taught about networks, my professor told me that he threatened me that he's going to infect me with the virus of networks and that that's a virus that would never leave you. Uh, that phrase has haunted me a lot over the past year as the words virus have taken on a whole other meaning that is not quite as trivial and playful as it was uh, back then. So um, anyway, it's a delight to see all of you here. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is a project that we've been working at both pre and, and during uh, the COVID crisis. Um, you can see that it's a part of a much larger collaboration with others uh, that are listed there, some of who you might recognize. Uh, uh, Leslie the Church, who I think is going to be an upcoming speaker in the series here. Um, and then uh, in particular, I would say Brennan and Doan, whose name is listed there and, uh, and uh, Jasmine, who are actually on the call, they're current graduate students, and they helped a lot with putting together this presentation till the last few, in the last final hours out here. And also uh, Arshia and Theodora, uh, who are currently members of the lab. Uh, we also have collaborators at Fudan University in, in China, in Shanghai, and you'll see in a minute why. A former PhD student of mine who was a TA for many of the MSc classes, some of you might rem remember her, Jackie Lane, uh, Paul Leonardi, who um, was a professor that many of you may have taken in the MSc program before he left us for uh, better weather at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and our collaborator from Washington, Michael Johnson. So with all of that said as acknowledgments, let me start with the uh, uh, article that Paul Leonardi and I published in 2018 in Harvard Business Review called Better People Analytics. Uh, and it was basically measure who they know, not just who they are. And the reason I bring this up is not because we're going to talk a lot about this, but the main premise of this article was that based upon the corpus of research on networks that have been done over the last several decades, we know that there are certain structural signatures, certain patterns in our network connections that help us identify whether we're going to be good at coming up with new ideas, the so-called ideation signature, or whether we're going to be influential, the so-called influence signature, or whether we are going to be uh, work well in a team together, efficiently in the team together, whether we are going to be innovative in a team together, how siloed we are going to be, and how vulnerable we are. I'm not going to go into details, but if you want to take a look at the article, some of you um, who have taken the class since 2018, 
actually have read this in, in the class itself, but it's a very short article and it provides you with some really interesting ideas on how you can, based on your network, identify who's likely to be influential, who's likely to come up with good ideas, which team is likely to get things done quickly, and which team is likely to get things done creatively. My goal in showing this to you today was because in the article we make the case that while this has been around for a while, the challenge is why, is the, why do more people don't use this in the workplace? Why aren't we using these kinds of signatures to identify key influencers? <clears throat> we make the case, the problem is that survey data, collecting this data from surveys from organizational network surveys is time consuming, you get low response rates and they can get rapidly obsolete because our networks are constantly changing. So we had a thought game. What if we could have survey data at minimal cost with 100% response updated 24 seven? And the problem is that now we can, thanks to all of these different technologies, whether it's Zoom that we're on or Slack or Microsoft Teams or Salesforce Chatter, et cetera, that because we are using these technologies, we have the ability to collect a lot of what we call digital exhaust data in the article. That if you start with an employee, you see who they message, you see who they sent a file to or a message to, who they badged, who they liked, and so on and so forth. And as you begin to look at this, you can get this real amazing picture of like almost a macroscope of all the interactions that are happening within the, uh, within the uh, network. And he said uh, that this is very similar to the idea of what we could do with the brain. When you look at a brain and you look for certain patterns, you see that the brain patterns based on uh, in, uh, tunneling microscopy on the left, there are certain patterns that you associated with uh, the brain of a healthy person. On the right, you have certain patterns associated with a person afflicted with schizophrenia. And so if we take the same idea, but instead of thinking of it as a microscope, we change it to a macroscope. And now what we have is something that if we are too close to the network, it doesn't look much. It looks like a very blurry picture. But just like was the case with Henri Matisse's pointillism, as you zoom out, you begin to see certain patterns in the data that allow you to be able to come up with ideas of what might be happening in that particular context. So starting in 2019, before the COVID crisis, uh, we began to see, could we use this digital trace data that is available um, about who mentions whom, who messages whom? And could we use it to predict what people would say on a survey with the hope that if that is possible, then in the future, we don't need to run surveys. We can just look at that kind of metadata uh, and from that, make a prediction of who's likely to look to whom for leadership, who's likely to look to whom for advice, trust, all of those kinds of good things. The short answer is based upon the research we've done so far in a few organizations, the answer is yes, we can. Not super well, but pretty darn well in predicting what people would say on a survey network uh, in terms of just looking, not even at, not looking at the content of the data, just looking at who messaged whom when, uh, or, or who at mentioned whom when, just that kind of information. But then COVID hit. And so we realized that just like our former mayor of the, of the city of Chicago, Ram Emanuel, we were not going to let a crisis go to waste. And we decided that what we could do is recognize that we could take advantage of the fact that since we had collected this data before COVID, we now had the opportunity to come into a 2020 worldwide experiment on virtual teaming in a crisis where we had the opportunity to see how networks change in a crisis before the crisis and during the crisis. And for a minute, I want you to imagine this one quotation. One day, some 32,000 employees stayed home. They weren't sick or on strike. Employees ranging from the CEO to phone operators were part of an experiment involving 100,000 people. Its purpose, to explore how fast a vast organization could go in transforming the workplace. This was the opening line from an article in Harvard Business Review. The only snag is it was Harvard Business Review 1998. You can see this was the opening line of that. And the idea was it was employees from AT&T and they were trying to do something that had not been done before, come up with a way of trying to create an artificial situation to see what the future of work would look like. Well, today we didn't have a choice in the matter. We all got to begin to do that. So here's my first polling question for you. Uh, oh, I should have mentioned we have some polling questions. We have, I think, 11 polling questions. First one, thinking back about work pre-COVID and today, did you work mostly or fully remote then and now, in-person then and now, in-person then and remote now, remote then and in-person now, out of work or it's complicated?
We're going to keep this going forward. That's good. Some of you may have deja vu from our MSc class where I would force you to be doing all these silly polls, and here we are still doing those. Um, and uh, I think we have gotten as many as we probably can. So in the interest of time, I would suggest we, um, we share the results. Are you going to go ahead? There we go. So you can see, not surprisingly, that 70% uh, of you almost have moved from in-person to remote. 10% uh, have stayed in person. 13% um, were remote then and remote now. Nice. And 8% uh, of you were out of work or it's complicated. Very good. Okay. So I wanted to do this to give you a sense of what we are facing now in this particular uh, situation. So what we did was uh, we collected data from five companies in the US and China. And as I said, the first part of the experiment was to predict, uh, to see if you could predict what people would answer in a survey uh, in response to just looking at the digital trace table. The three questions I'm going to talk about today is about the crisis. How do work networks change from before to during to after COVID-19? And you might say, how do we study after COVID-19? The key here is we collected data from the US and China. And as far as China is concerned, we have been post-COVID for quite a while. They've been back at work for a long time. And so we might have an opportunity to get a preview of what that work looked like uh, in, by looking at the data we have from China. The second is how do high performers or network stars, as the title said, differ from others? And then finally, how do go brokers differ from no brokers in times of crisis? And I'll define that cutesy turn of phrase that I put in there at the end. So for the purpose of this particular presentation, I'm going to focus on just one sample, a multinational industrial manufacturing company uh, in China. We collected data from three departments, 185 employees uh, who worked out of 34 offices in 16 cities. And uh, they worked on 18 teams. Some of these teams were within a city and some of them were across cities. Uh, this is just to give you a timeline. So we collected so this is 2019, Jan 12th, 2019 was when they became aware of COVID. They left their office uh, sometime towards the end of January. And believe it or not, they came back to their office right around Feb 23rd. Doesn't that make us feel envious as compared to what we've gone through in this country as compared to the, the Chinese uh, version of the COVID crisis? And of course, you see um, how the, con the confirmed new cases and the deaths, they all sort of uh, tracked this return back to the office. So essentially, these are the major events. Now, it was also quite interesting that a time when they left the office also coincided or overlapped with the Chinese New Year. So they essentially got an extended Chinese New Year um, uh, vacation, so to speak, uh, in order to uh, accommodate this particular crisis. So we basically had four periods. We said normal working was data we collected before COVID. Crisis looming was data that we collected in that period right before crisis hit before they moved to remote work. That was the shift to remote and then the phase return that followed it. So in a situation like this, we collected data from the company throughout this entire period. And the data we are analyzing is from the uh, 8th of October through the uh, uh, through March of, of, of 2020. But the data that we collected was using a tool that was very similar to Zoom and Microsoft Teams. It was not Zoom or Microsoft, but extremely similar. And so we had all of the essentially data of the kind that we have right now. <clears throat> and from that, we created a communication network of who meets with whom across the 185 employees, et cetera. So if you can look at it, each person here is a, each, each node in the picture on the right hand side is a person. And the link is that the two of them were on a Zoom call. It could have been just a two person Zoom call. It could have been up to a seven person Zoom call. A call like the one we're in right now, where I think last I saw there were about 70 people, we did not consider this as a meeting because this is not really a meeting. This is, you know, one person gabbing and other people dozing off and falling asleep and doing their own multitasking. But if a meeting is something that is seven people or less, that's what the definition we use. Now, it turns out that 93% of the meetings had seven or fewer participants. So that's where the network data came from. So again, just to give you a quick sense, if you look at it, these networks looked a little different. This was the data in each of these periods uh, that was collected, 3rd of December during the normal uh, uh, working period, 15th of Jan during crisis looming, 14th of February during the shift to remote, and 21st of February during the phased return to work. So my next question uh, that's gonna come up is a survey question, but it's about how many meetings with, we wanted to know how many meetings with how many people and for how long 
it happened before, during, and after the crisis. So you have your second polling question now. Thinking back about work pre-COVID and today, do you have more meetings now than you did before the COVID crisis? Again, we'll keep it to 30 seconds so that we can stay on time here. Maybe fewer if we can get it done fast enough. Now remember, in this country, we are still mostly in the, uh, in the pandemic. So we can only talk about the old normal and the new normal, unlike when we talk about uh, China, where we already have a chance to look at the next normal. Okay, so you say that 48% uh, of you, almost half, have now more meetings today than you did before. Let's see how that compares with what happened in, uh, in China from the Zoom calls there. What we found was that the Zoom calls dramatically increased, but increased most during. So the number of daily meetings uh, fell a little bit right before the crisis. It moved up after the crisis, but this is the scary part. It moved up even more after the crisis was over, not just during the crisis, but even after the crisis, there was a dramatic increase. And I think that if this is a harbinger of things to come, this is quite a scary thought that meetings increased 53% during the phase return to the office. Even when people were back in the office, they were still having more meetings than they did, way more meetings than they did before the crisis broke. The next question then, question three, is thinking back about the work pre-COVID and today, do you have larger sized meetings now than before? In other words, do you have, uh, uh, we need, yeah, there we go, thank you. Uh, we need to ask ourselves the question, are the number of people attending the meeting more or less than what they did, uh, than what you did beforehand? And again, here we are really talking about meetings that could range from a size of two to seven, because that was the variability, that was the range that we were looking at here. So. Okay. So we are seeing that basically what you're reporting here is about half of you said that um, it is not that it is it is not larger that it's perhaps smaller, uh, but 24% said it varies and 27% said yes it was larger. Now what we find in the case of uh, the COVID crisis in China in this particular organization that the number of meet that size of the meeting went up from an average of 3.6 to 4.29 during the crisis it went up to six during the shift to remote, but it's now dipped down again afterwards. So while we had more meetings, the number of people attending these meetings peaked during the crisis and is now coming back again down after the crisis. Okay, so then the next question here is, do you have longer meetings than you did before? So are the, uh, is the length of these meetings longer? So this would be the new poll for you. Did the, did the meetings get longer or shorter? This looks like it's a slam dunk and no. <clears throat> yep. Okay, I think I'll go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And so a little over half of you said that these meetings are getting longer. And about 30% of you said, uh, no, 30% of you said that you're having meetings that are getting longer and 53% said that the meetings are not longer than before. Um, of course, I'm assuming you're not taking into account the big commute times that you have now between your home office and your home kitchen and your, and your home uh, bedroom, et cetera, which certainly helps in terms of uh, duration between meetings rather than the duration of the meetings. Okay, so uh, what, we, what did we find there? We found that on an average day, so this was the average in purple and then the maximum during that period and lower, we find that in fact, the number of the meetings did get longer uh, and continued to get longer, in not just during the looming period, but also during the actual shift to remote and fell, but only very marginally, it's more or less plateaued when we came back to the office, et cetera. So again, what you're seeing here is that at least during the focus, during the focus period of the study, that there were some changes that didn't revert back to the old normal but we were in fact setting the tone for something that might be a predictor of the next normal. So again, the, the, the bottom line here is that the new normal is going to be socially distanced and when remote, not more frequent meetings, but longer duration and larger groups for the next normal, be, be aware of that because there are gonna be more meetings and they're gonna be still longer and larger than what they were in the old normal. 
So the next question we wanted to talk about was why do people, or how do people change with whom they are collaborating? So we talk about boundary spanning, that is to what extent are we crossing different kinds of boundaries, whether it's geographical boundaries, team boundaries, et cetera. And here what we found was that pre-crisis, one third of the meeting were with those who are working in the same office. So one third of our meetings pre-crisis tended to be with people who were in the same geographical uh, location as, as us. However, after the crisis was over, two thirds of our meeting were with those in the same office. So what you've seen here is something that sometimes get referred to as circling the wagons, that when we face a crisis, we tend to circle the wagons and have more communication internally overall than going outside. So more of the meetings that we are having uh, tend to be with people within our own geographical co-location. And remember, even though the geographical co-location was still often electronic meetings, as you see, uh, because even though they were in the same office, they would still sit in the same office, but be socially distanced and on electronic digital calls very often, because many of the other people on the call might not be uh, there in person. So here again, in the pre-COVID, two thirds of the virtual teaming is among those working in different places. And now two thirds of the virtual teaming in the next normal is among those who are working in the same office. The next boundary spanning thing we came up with was something we call the external internal index. That is to what extent is your ratio of external communication outside your team compared to your communication within your team. And basically thinking about, so the next survey question is thinking back about work pre COVID and today, do you spend more time interacting with members in your team than you did before. So are you spending a lot more time, a bit more time, a bit less time, or a lot less time with people inside your own team? So we're not thinking about the outside team, just within your own team, are you spending more time? I suppose we should have put a category call about the same, in which case you can just choose between a bit more time and a bit less time. Okay, so consistent with what we just said, that the, a, a plurality of you say that you're spending a bit more time interacting with members within your own team. 24% uh, said a lot more time. So between those two, you're basically confirming the fact, the circling of the wagons, and that is we do spend much more time talking within our team than we did before that. Um, okay, so what did we, uh, uh, let's, let me ask you the next question, and that is how much do you spend more time talking outside your team? So thinking back again about the work, so let's put the polling question six out there now. And this one again, thinking about work pre-COVID and today. Um, thank you. Do you spend more time interacting with others outside your team? A lot more time, a bit more time, a bit less, a lot less, or it varies. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> so we can go ahead and end the poll. You see uh, that's a little different. Unlike the more time that you spend, a lot more time that you spend within your team, you're spending, there are fewer of you who are spending a lot more time within your team, about the same spending a bit more time within the team. So you get the sense that there is this circling of the wagons issue that I was just mentioning that shows up in these kinds of results. Um, what did we find? Uh, what did we find when we looked at the results in our study? We found that uh, there was an external focus that was uh, there was uh, that is in other words we would spend uh, quite a lot of time talking to people outside the poll. And then, uh, did you share the results of this one, Haley? I think no, you did not. Or yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, my fault. I I should have done that. My apologies. Okay, so we see that pre-crisis, there was a bit of an external focus. So just to explain, zero means you were balanced between internal and external. Anything above zero means you were tilting to the outside. Anything below zero means you were sort of biasing and, and giving a slight preference to internal team connections. What do we see? We see that again, as the crisis went forward, just as you answered in your own polling questions, there was in fact more and more of internal focus. And that even after the crisis was over, we came to a more balanced approach. We didn't go external as much as we did previously, but we were more balanced about it. So why there was an internal focus during the crisis and there was a more balanced ap approach when we came back to it. Again, a sign that we are changing in irreversible ways. So in summary, the, the new normal had an internal focus and the next normal had 
uh, 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 there's more balance between the external and internal when you move to that final one. The next set of questions were, how do people change with whom they are collaborating? So who, who are the people we are collaborating with in this particular case? So here we asked the question, uh, in the past month, who have you interacted with in person? So this, we had asked this question uh, prior to the crisis the, in a survey. We said, who have you interacted with in person? And then what we wanted to do was to see whether we were interacting with the same people that we did before, which would be like a deepening of the network, or would we now, because we were liberated by technology and we could Zoom anyone we wanted, were we broadening our network? So before we know what the results were, let's come to the another survey question for you, question seven out of 11, in case you're getting Zoom survey fatigue or Zoom poll fatigue. We only have, uh, we have a total of only 11 of these. And so thinking back about work pre-COVID and today, did you create new work ties during the past year? So did you reach out to new people now during the crisis that you had not previously had? And I'm talking about work ties, so it's in the context of work, um, not necessarily people that you met uh, because of all the extra time you have on TikTok. So I see here again that, um, um, that a small number of you, 18% created new ties during the past year. 37% uh, um, said not really, and about 45%, the majority said yes, but a few. Um, well, let's see again how this compares with what we found. So what we found was that there was, there was definitely a sense in which before, uh, before the crisis, two thirds of those who we had online meetings were not people that we interacted with in person. So we were having online people with different people than who we were interacting with in person. But that that number changes so that now when the shift was to remote and the only option was to meet digitally, not surprisingly, the digital interaction was replacing in-person interaction. So in other words, we were deepening our network, not broadening our network. More and more of our communications were with the same people that we had said we had had in-person communications. So we go online and talk to the same people that we were talking to offline. And then if you go further, now what we find is that half of those we meet online are also the people uh, who we meet with online are also the people who were in an in-person contact. So in summary, the old normal was that one third of remote teaming is with prior in-person contacts. And now it is that um, the new and next normal has it, uh, sorry that the results didn't get shared before, but I, I read it out to you and you can see I didn't make it up. Um, and now you see the new and the next normal, the remote work phase return. Now about half of the remote teaming is with prior in-person contacts. So we are in fact now using the technology to deepen our networks with many of the people with whom we had in-person contacts before. So the, uh, the, the penultimate part of the, of the results that I'm gonna share with you today about how networks are changing, changing during a crisis is the word churn. How do our networks churn during a crisis? And you might be wondering what exactly is meant by churn. In order to help put you in the right frame of mind, let me ask you this question. Thinking back about work pre-COVID and today, to what extent did you find yourself dissolving or pausing work ties during the past year? By pausing means suspending them, essentially not, ha not, not having them as active, making them dormant, if some of you may remember from our networks plus. So again, let's go ahead and get that survey question out there. Here we go. <clears throat> Okay, I think we can go ahead and end the poll and, and share the results. Um, and so 17% uh, of you said that you have dissolved a lot of the ties. A few of you, 47% said that you've dissolved or paused, half of you said you've dissolved or paused a few of your ties. And then 36% said uh, not, no real change, et cetera. So that's remarkable that 47% of you acknowledge that this has actually uh, a, a casualty of the COVID crisis is that you have done some of that. So now we go to the next polling question that you see on the screen, thinking back about the, um, about the work pre-COVID and today, 
How, did, how many of you, to what extent did you find yourself reactivating work ties that you had previously paused during the past year? And by the way, this is to put you into a frame of mind of what we mean by churn. Because churn refers to the fact that sometimes you create new ties, sometimes you dissolve your ties, sometimes you reactivate ties that you had either dissolved or paused, et cetera. So again, this notion is a, is a very important idea in networks because some of you may recall that we had talked about in class that very often things like Facebook are good as dormant networks. These are not the networks that are active networks, even though we sometimes say we have all those as friends, but it's a great dormant network because you can go back and activate it easily when you need to, because everything is right there and you can pick up where you left off with people, with tools like LinkedIn, et cetera. Okay, so the results here is that about half of you have reactivated a few links and about half of you have not done very much. So, so rather very few of you, only 7%, who said that they have in fact um, uh, um, activated a lot of ties, et cetera. So again, now I wanna compare this to what we see in, uh, in the study that we did. So again, our, our graduate student team uh, took the task of going in and actually taking networks at each of these points and coloring new nodes, new links that were being created, that is people who had not previously spoken, and those are what we call tie creation. The black are the nodes that they were involved in, they continue to be involved in. The dotted are the, are the links that they dissolved, that they had previously, which then they dissolved. And the green are the ones they reactivated. And what did we find? We found, we, what we also wanted to look at here was, was there a difference amongst who were high performers and low performers? Because there is reason to believe that churning is a secret of the high performer. And sure enough, we found that during the pandemic, high performers were much more likely to be the boundary spanners. They were more likely to create new inter-team ties and dissolve some of the intra-team ties compared with low performers. Now think about what we found earlier on. There's a general tendency to circle the wagons, to have more and more connections during a crisis within your team. What we find here is that while that's how networks tend to form, tend to form those are not the networks that tend to perform well that high performing people in networks are those who exactly at the crisis time are creating more inter-team ties and dropping more of the intra-team ties as compared to low performers. We also found that these people, the networking secrets of high performers, they also more likely to drop inter-team times to free up cognitive space for new contacts. So just think about this. They, I just got done telling you they created those ties and now I'm here to tell you that yes, they created them, but they were quick to drop them. So these were not ties that they wanted to do on a regular basis. There was a sense in which they were looking for uh, network links as and when they needed it. So they knew exactly when to forge that tie. And they also were very strategic about dropping those ties so that they could create free up cognitive space for new contacts and for uh, other opportunities, et cetera. So you see why that word churn gets used in this particular context. And then finally, in this particular case, we also said higher performers were more likely to reactivate both intra-team and inter-team ties. So this is the power of saying there are situations where if you decide that you want to be a high performer, you should be strategic about dissolving ties as and when you need them from one period to another during a crisis, but also be very quick to reactivate those ties as and when they are needed, et cetera. And so this is another very interesting finding that is not inconsistent with what has been known in the past generally about the power of reactivating dormant ties. And then the final section of this uh, presentation, uh, we're gonna go for broke. And we're gonna ask ourselves the question, how do we broker our networks during our crisis? And uh, some of you might remember us talking a lot about brokering uh, in, if, if you happen to have taken the, the networks uh, class. And in general, I'm going to just remind those and acquaint those who may not be familiar with this idea since we're not talking about financial brokerage here, uh, though that's where the metaphor came from. So I, basically this is how do I handle my connections between other members of my team or my organization? So if you look on the right-hand side, you are the star, and then you have two people that you talk to. And then you have to ask yourself to what extent, what is the way in which you manage this relationship between two people that you know. And in order to, to get ourselves in the right mindset for that, I have another, the, the, last, the second last survey question for today's uh, webinar. And if we can go ahead and launch question 10. 
thinking back about work pre-COVID and COVID, I mediate interactions. Oops, sorry. I, oops. Oh, here we go. I mediate interactions between coworkers that may not trust one another. What do I mean by that? Just to clarify. It means that if I have two people, I, I serve as a mediator between them. I, you know, I keep them apart and I serve as the mediator. I go talk to A and then I go talk to B and then I try to figure out how to make this work. Um, and that's called a mediating role as a broker, where you keep them apart and you try to find a way to get everyone to work together. And so we have 47, 49 respondents, keep it going. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you on this, uh, on this call and actively participating in the survey. So thank you for doing that. That's really exciting. Okay, so let's go ahead and share the results. And so you find that during a crisis, you are 11% of you doing a lot more often, 32% are doing it more often, 35% of you are saying it's about the same and 16% and 4%, 23% are basically saying less often or a lot less often. Good for you. Well, one of the things that we, we do when we try to understand what role a networker does is some people are people who do this kind of, uh, who do brokering in this kind of fashion. That is, they serve as a mediator. But there's a second kind of broker. And you're gonna hear about that second kind of broker in the next polling question, but just what that means is you are the kind of broker who says, I'm gonna bring these two people together. I'm not gonna keep them apart. Instead, I'm gonna bring them together. So here it is, think back about it. And then how often in the past year have you been uh, introducing people together so that they might benefit from getting acquainted? So this is the situation where you say, oh, I know that A really has the talent in this area and B has a talent in this area, but A has a need in a different area. Why don't that bring people together? So that's a broker who brings people together. So let's go ahead and see how you're doing on the poll. You got 44, this is the last question. For those of you who are getting keyboard fatigue, this is it, this is the last one. And Almost there, yeah, I think so. So let's go ahead and so again, there. This is the time when you you need when you you serve as a broker, but as a broker you bring people together. You don't serve as the medi mediator between them, but you actually bring them together. You connect them, in other words. Okay, so let's go ahead and share the results. And half of you said you more often than what you did before. You're bringing people together, and uh, about twenty eight percent said you are the same. And much fewer percentage, 14% said you bring them together less often. Now, what I've introduced to you here is to two concepts of brokering that in often represent, some would argue, a style. Some people like to be the mediator and try to gain advantage by that and saying, look, I'm going to be uniquely positioned because I'm going to take A's idea and B's idea, or I'm going to help broker, broker uh, the role of being able to uh, you know, make sure that the, uh, these people can work, but I keep my central position in the network, right? Because they, are, they, they have to rely on me. So I'm, I'm labeling that for the purpose of the next few slides. I call that go brokers. These are people who like to go and broker. As opposed to the second category of people who introduce one another, and I'm gonna label them no brokers because they don't wanna be broking, brokering between people. They allow these people to come together and talk. These people then go off and do their own thing they will still benefit from it because if these two people do things together and something good comes out of that, they're gonna be grateful to me for connecting them together, which means that in turn, they're gonna introduce me to other friends of theirs. So in some ways, I'm gonna get more diverse connections, but I'm doing it in the second case by investing some of my social capital and introducing people and getting myself out of the way. So I'm calling this the no broker. So. The question then is, how do I take advantage of my position? The mediators do it uh, by way of looking at, uh, they take advantage by being a go-between. So these are the mediators, what I just said to you. And this question that I asked you to do is from an actual survey scale that is used to measure uh, what I call is technically called mediators that I'm calling go-betweens. And the uh, connectors, those who benefit by connecting people together, as you see on the right-hand side out here, these are what, I, what we call, what I'm calling the no-betweens. So how does this change during the COVID crisis? So for this, we're gonna have a change in setting. We're gonna leave our Chinese uh, branch of a multinational company 
and instead focus on a national survey that uh, we did here in the United States of over 1,400 workers. And we asked them about their brokerage strategies. We asked them the exact same question and a few others uh, that you just uh, answered in the Zoom poll about how what, what's your preference in terms of brokerage strategy? Are you a go broker and then separately are you a no broker? Some people could be both. So it's not either or. Some people might do both. Some people may do neither. Some people might do one and not the other. Now, in our sample, we found that, so this is the, in, the, in the US context, we interviewed, as I said, over 1,400 people. 537 were in-person workers who remained in-person workers. 114 were uh, remote who remained remote. Um, the largest number, not surprisingly, were 583 who transitioned from in-person to remote. And 82 actually moved from remote to in-person during this period of time. Now, what was interesting is we thought, oh, I wonder whether those variations will be representative of differences in age or salary or org size. And as you look at these little graphics, just in general, you see that the contours of the distribution are about the same, which basically means that the proportion of people um, in large organizations who fall into each of these categories is not any different from those in, uh, in um, small organizations, et cetera. So, we see that in general, across these different situations, across the different transitions, they remain the same. So with that then said, we wanted to ask ourselves questions. How do these people who are go-betweeners, how are they different from no-betweeners? And so we're just gonna wrap up for the next few slides here. We found that when go-betweeners are transitioning work settings, that is they're moving from remote to in-person or in-person to remote, they seek more advice than those who are not go-betweeners. So these are the people who keep people separate, they are the ones who need more advice. They talk to a lot of people for advice as compared to the no-betweeners. And in the case of the no-betweeners, a transition from remote to in-person, they actually ended up seeking less advice as compared to those who are not no-betweeners. We also wanted to see whether go-betweeners and no-betweeners differed in the extent to which they enjoyed working. And here we find that go-betweeners, when they transition work settings, they, oh, should be enjoy working more with others who are not go be, uh, who are not go between us, and then the second case is no between us enjoy working with others more than those who are no between us. So what you see is that people who are bringing people together are also the same people who say, yeah, I enjoy working with others more. And so there are certain sort of uh, social benefits of being a no between us that you see in this case. When it comes to perceived status, we find that when go between us are transitioning work settings they perceive higher status than those who are not go between. So people who hold people apart as they move into from remote to in-person or from in-person to remote. So just to change in context, the people who keep people apart, they see themselves as growing in importance. They see themselves as more powerful because they are, they are, they're the ones who are holding the keys. And the no betweeners, on the other hand, also perceive higher status than those who are not no between us, even if they did not make a transition. So the case of the go-betweeners, the only time they felt that higher status is when they move from one context to another. But the no between us felt higher status irrespective of whether they move from remote to person or stayed in remote or stayed in person or vice versa. And then in terms of their perception of team performance, and this is our last slide here, is that we noticed that the, that the people who were the performance of people who are go-betweeners remains the same or gets worse as compared to those who are not go-betweeners when they make a transition, while the no-betweeners, on the other hand, their team performance is always better compared to those who are not no-betweeners. So now I'm going to leave you with this tongue-twisting alliteration to see to what extent you yourself are a go-betweener or a no-betweener. Neither of them is better or worse, but knowing something about your style and where your strengths are will help you be more strategic in terms of being able to cash in on those strengths. Some people clearly benefit by being go-betweeners, by being between people and brokering things. Others benefit by connecting people who are not connected and therefore getting benefits for those people and indirectly for themselves. Again, I just wanna leave now with a slide. There are lots of people on the left who have really worked a lot on this particular project, but I want to leave you with uh, the people who I've worked most closely specifically on the set of analyses and the slides uh, that we've spent hours and end on Zoom working through, uh, et cetera. And I'll give a special shout out to uh, Jasmine and Brennan, who are two PhD students uh, who have been working tirelessly over the last uh, several months 
on analyzing uh, this, just a sliver of data that you see out here. And also Arshia, who joined us as an undergraduate. So I'm very proud that we've had undergraduates and in fact, some high school students join us on working on these projects. And of course, uh, you will get to hear more about some other work we've been doing uh, with Leslie in the weeks ahead. So I will thank you and uh, be available for any questions, comments, uh, brickbats, disagreements, um, yeah, feel free to, you know, either uh, raise your hand if you like in the uh, uh, gallery here that I'm looking at and we can ask a question or type them into the chat might be easier too. Um, but we do have one question in the chat, um, Nash, uh, from somebody who's looking to network on LinkedIn and she's asking your opinion. Um, during this time, would you say that people are more, less or the same in terms of being reluctant, reluctant to be brokers to someone they don't know? Um, she's getting some feedback. It sounds like that people are maybe exhausted and uh, the, it, it maybe the, the not knowing somebody makes it a little tougher. So uh, this, are you, are you referring to Eve's question? Yes. Thank you, Eve. That's a really, really good question. And I think that providing the context to someone who's not working and trying to network, I think that is a, a really challenging situation. Like in many of these scenarios, I think that, uh, the point uh, that, you know, this represents the metaphor of the K, the K effects that we've seen in so many other contexts. And that is the, uh, the situation where some people have actually benefited a lot in terms of their networks uh, during this period of time and others have, uh, who are shut out feel even more shut out in this particular case. Um, I do see that uh, part of it is just digital fatigue. I think people are uh, at least work-related digital fatigue that people just don't have time to do a lot of these things, et cetera. But I can also tell you that uh, there are legitimate instances where people are in fact, increasing the amount of scams that they're putting into uh, in, in digital networking spaces. Um, just this morning, actually, I was talking to a colleague who was saying that if you go and look at some of these, um, you go look at even some of these Facebook pages, et cetera, and you see innocuous questions like, oh, I'm trying to plan a trip uh, somewhere. Uh, do you have any suggestions of who of you might be interested in uh, c comparing notes about people who are planning trips? It turns out that in that particular case, this person who was posing as, a, as, a, as just a, you know, a tra potential traveler was actually a travel agent who was essentially out there trying to fish, if you've heard that word, uh, for potential customers, et cetera. So I think that's the reason why you see this level of wariness of creating network ties with people, et cetera. I think uh, one of the things that, uh, we've, uh, that we'll talk about is that very often you are more likely to, so there are different types of users of LinkedIn, right? The first type of user of LinkedIn is a Rolodex user. So this is the person who only connects with people who they met with. So instead of having, when you meet someone, you get their card and you put it in the Rolodex, that's the same principle you follow in putting someone on LinkedIn after you've met them. The second one is just a collector. They're the ones who just want to build as many connections as possible and they go willy-nilly and try to link it as many people as they can, et cetera. And I'll tell you something funny about how I found out about some of these things, both on LinkedIn and Facebook. Then there's a third category of, of people who are recruiting. So they are essentially looking at LinkedIn as a way of recruiting for their companies. And the fourth category is probably the one that Eve is talking about where you're looking for a job on LinkedIn. So these are the four categories. Now, very often I'll find that there's a genre, not, when I look at it, and I think many others do the same thing, you look for that principle of trust that I think uh, also was brought up uh, by, uh, I think Kate brought that up, the notion of trust, that you're more likely to trust someone when a large number of them are friends of friends. So if you have, you know, I'm much more likely to trust Toby because we have many friends in common because that way I know that Toby is not gonna mess with me, nor am I gonna mess with Toby because all our common friends are gonna find out about it. So as a result of that, um, you often look at LinkedIn uh, requests and see what common friends you have. In many cases you'll go, oh yeah, these are all people who are from communication research, or these are all people who went to the same college as me. And then that gives you more, um, uh, you know, you may be more open to being trusting someone even if you haven't met them. There's a category that I've found where I find that the collection of people that they list come from very disparate areas. But what those people have in common is they seem to be saying yes to all kinds of strangers. So it's almost a new category of common people that I have found who must be saying yes to everyone. And they come from very different areas, some from communication research, some from industry, et cetera. And all they have in common is they say yes to absolutely everyone. I'm very wary of connecting to people 
when I share those people in common with them, et cetera. So I think that uh, there is a genuine uh, concern about trust that has got exacerbated during the COVID crisis. And I just wish you the best even being able to make the, the one connection that you need in order to get a good job. You don't, you don't need a lot of them to do that, et cetera. Um, Bob Wait, Chad, is asking, sorry, oh, go ahead. No, Chad has, uh, Chad Ease has oh, his Chad, go ahead, please. please go ahead, Chad. Chad. Yeah. Yes, 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 thank you, Chad. Good hello, to see Dr. You. Contractor, and hello, Toby. Um, <laughs> question I have is, is there any data or trends being, that, that you've seen as far as the difference when people use text versus video and also video outside of just like a video chat, like embedded video, um, when like doing networking activities, um, is there like people, do people respond more favorably, um, to when they're able to see and hear someone talk versus it's just like, you know, a text message or a LinkedIn invite that's text only. Um, that's a very, very good question. And I will say that, the one evidence we've seen, and this, is, this was even pre-COVID, is that there is a lot of, um, 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 wait, I, I, okay, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's also a lot of interest in terms of uh, uh, multimodal communication. That increasingly, Chad, what is happening is it's not a question of A versus B. Um, in the old days, there was a big theory called media richness theory that really basically said, you know, and I want to make, when I want to ask someone for information, am I better off just sending them an email? But if I'm trying to negotiate uh, a pay raise, then am I better off meeting them face to face? Well, the dirty little secret is that uh, negotiating a, a pay raise face to face is better for the person doing the negotiation, asking for the pay raise, not the person who's being asked the pay raise. So there's no easy answer to that. But in general, what we found now is that multimodal communication, where people are increasingly using these, ta these channels concurrently to one another. Now, if your question is, is it embedded within it or is it in a separate chat stream? Uh, I don't know of any work that's done on that. And that, that part of it is, is interesting to see if that alone can make a difference. Part of it is that as part of this beta test, we are seeing new features added on every day. One of the things that some of you may have encountered is that there are many Zoom sessions now where depending on whether you switch on that feature, you see a constant uh, subtitling that is done in real time of the presenter talking so that you're able to get closed captioning in real time. Now, does that add to it? Not just for those who might be, um, uh, you know, uh, in some way deficient, but also as a way of helping those who are listening to you and reading in front of that, what you're saying in addition to the slide. So these are all sort of uh, issues that uh, I think we are seeing unfold in front of us uh, even as we speak. Good question there. Um, um, Patricia asked a question that, that I think you could probably spend multiple classes teaching about, but asking specifically about, find, did you find any cultural differences between the Chinese and American companies in terms of networking? Um, yeah. it, okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. And then there's a second question as well, but that's the first half. Um, how I broke in my COVID office is somewhat different from my COVID personal life. Yes, so I can answer both of those questions quickly. So for the first answer, I will actually turn to the research done by, um, uh, one of Toby's and my uh, good friend, Ron Burt, who's a professor at the University of Chicago and also now at Bocconi University in Milan. And uh, Ron has done a lot of work uh, to empirically verify something that has been talked about for a very long time. And that is that the Chinese um, understand networks to be much more focused on, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that uh, we can use on there. Not that I don't want to give props to all of you, but so yeah, so there is that notion that uh, you know, if you that the Chinese understand relationships and so they give much more importance to it. If an American goes to do business in China and uh, they'll find that if they want to get down to business, the sort of John Wayne, you know, holster uh, uh, shooting from your holster approach, that's just not going to work in China because they need a lot of time to build relationships and talk to one another, etc. Before you go further. The term is called Quan Shi. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Um, and what he found was that when it came to relationships that he was looking at for, for people who were interested in doing important trusted things like starting firms, who do you go to for advice, et cetera, that the differences that people have been propounding between China and the US doesn't necessarily show up in the data. And so this is not specifically during the COVID crisis, but overall, Patricia, the, uh, there's now been a rethinking of whether uh, there are big cultural differences. There are certainly some cultural differences that you see. There's certainly 
uh, all the work that has been done by people like Michelle Gelfand, who talk about power distances across different countries. So those are absolutely uh, true. Uh, and we see evidence of that. I'll give you an anecdotal evidence of that, that uh, we've been benefited from in some cases. When we do these surveys in China, and we go into this organization that we studied, we got a close to 100% response rate. If they were told to answer the survey, 100% of them responded to the survey. When we did this in the United States, after about four months of repeated, repeated requests and reminders and giving them money, giving them gift cards, we got to close to 70%. That's right there, a telling difference in the cultural patterns in the workplace that you'd like to see. The second question that you asked, Patricia, about how you, whether you differ, uh, broker differently in the COVID office from the COVID personal life, that is a huge topic of discussion. The idea of the extent to which uh, are, whether we, you know, the, no, the, the joke is, are we working from home or are we living at work, right? So, uh, and to what extent uh, we've collected data, I don't have it to report here today, but we've collected data on the effect of work on domestic life and the effect of domestic life on work. And the preliminary results that we looked at just last week, Brennan and Jasmine, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the results that we looked at um, this, this past week is that there seems to be a much greater impact of work impacting life than life impacting work. In other words, we have put a primacy in this country, we put a primacy on making sure that work doesn't get interfered. And on the other hand, life does. And that's really problematic in some ways, I think, and it's, it's a very telling difference. And uh, the, uh, it was a remarkable statistical difference that I think uh, we definitely need to pay attention to uh, as we move forward on that front. So well, the other part of it I would say, and I know we're almost out of time, is that Brennan in particular, but we've done another survey out where we are trying to understand whether our, uh, whether our networks in the personal life, not necessarily in COVID, but whether our personal networks, our personal networking style, if we are go brokers or no brokers in our personal life networks, are we also then going to be go brokers or no brokers in our professional work networks? And so we have collected the data on that. We are analyzing that right now. And part of it is to see, uh, frankly, if we can learn something that as you know, when people go in for employment and you do a lot of different tests in HR, et cetera, almost all those tests are about things like your personality, et cetera. We believe that there may be a chance to do a small test where we ask people about their personal networks and learn from that something about their networking style to the extent that we have evidence that it transfers into uh, the workplace. And the evidence that we have so far is from space research data that I promised uh, Bob, I promised Leslie I wouldn't talk about it because I don't want to steal any of her thunder because she's going to be talking about that research. So we made a clear demarcation that I'm going to stay away from talking about the space research and she will focus on that instead in her talk. So this, that's a shameless plug for her presentation, by the way. But Thank what you. Brennan has found is in fact that um, in the space research, that if we are trying to predict how someone will get along with a small crew over a 45 day isolated period, we can predict a lot of how, they, how they'll behave inside that crew if we ask them questions about their networks in life in general. Uh, and if they tell us in their networks and life in general that they, that they pretty much talk to people who are like them in terms of age, gender, military, civilian status, et cetera, then the same thing is going to be true. Uh, that same thing is going to be true here as well. Uh, in, inside the workplace, they'll have the same kind of uh, proclivities to talk to people, birds of a feather, et cetera. I know we're at the top of the hour, in fact, past the top of the hour. So thank you so much for sticking around till the Q&A, et cetera. It was really, really wonderful to see you, though I must say that doing this in person. I can't wait for it. And yes, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone uh, as well. I almost wrote something green, but couldn't find anything uh, in my wardrobe that matched. It wouldn't look outlandish. So. No, this has been terrific. Thank you uh, for, for taking the time with us today, Nishir. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, informative, insightful, thought-provoking as always. Um, and you're right. So I just put it in the, in the chat there on April 14th is our next webinar. There's maybe going to be one in two weeks, but it's not official yet. So keep an eye on your email. But um, April 14th, uh, Professor Leslie DeChurch is going to talk to us about um, the uh, research and learnings that she has in preparing teams for missions to Mars and crisis communication and flawless teamwork um, and uh, three major takeaways from, from that research and experience. Uh, with us as well. So it's, it's kind of the second part 
of this series here. And so we're excited and hope that everybody can make it back um, in April for that, that piece as well. But again, thank you everybody for joining today. Keep an eye out on your email, um, visit our website for, for upcoming webinars and uh, have a terrific, as I should, St. Patrick's Day. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Josh. Nice thank to you, see you again. again. Good to see you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.